Hello, this is John Golan, and this is part four in my series on aircraft performance and mission analysis. And today we're going to discuss energy maneuverability. Energy maneuverability arose in the latter 1960s as a new approach to how to analyze fighter capability. Prior generations of fighter aircraft have been developed around a few discrete performance criteria. Maximum speed, maximum altitude, time to altitude, but without a broader means of assessing how solid or, or robust a particular design happened to be. EM theory was developed in 1965 by then Major John Boyd of the U.S. Air Force and Thomas Christie, a mathematician and computer scientist. EM theory approached aircraft capability, fighter capability, from a global standpoint. What it did is it evaluated excess energy or specific excess power across the spectrum of the envelope rather than settling on a particular narrow flight condition, a particular speed. And what it does is it creates isoplots of specific excess power across a range of speed and altitude or speed and turn rate conditions. This allows aircraft to be compared across an envelope rather than a single discrete criteria. There's a lot of data that's embedded into an EM plot. You know, on the vertical axis, you typically will see turn rate. And on the horizontal axis, you'll see Mach number or speed. The envelope will typically have a left-hand edge that will be defined by the lift limit of the aircraft. So that's where the aircraft will stall, no longer have the ability to keep it in the air. It's going to start falling out of the sky. You can cross that line, but again, you've exceeded your ability to provide enough lift to sustain flight. The upper limit is going to be described by the maximum G number, G loading, that the aircraft is capable of sustaining. And the right-hand limit will typically be some kind of a dynamic pressure limit. So this is either a structural limit on the aircraft or a limit in the propulsion system. Now if we take a look at the uppermost turn rate, the max turn rate, we can see that where the lift limit coincides with the G limit, you'll expect to see the max instantaneous turn rate. And that turn rate will be associated with a corner speed. That's the Mach number or speed at which this particular capability is achieved at this particular Mach number. You'll also see a series of ISO contours for specific excess power. Among them will be a zero specific excess power line. This represents the max sustained turn rate for the aircraft. Note that it is a function of the Mach number as well as altitude. Above the max sustained turn rate, specific excess power will be negative, meaning that the aircraft will either have to lose speed or altitude if it wants to fly in that regime. Below the max sustained turn rate, the specific excess power becomes positive, meaning the aircraft can accelerate or climb. Now there's a great deal of insight that can be gained by overlaying the EM diagrams for two different aircraft on top of each other to understand how a dissimilar air combat engagement would play itself out between the two. The first thing to note is that in a real EM diagram, and this one is taken again from published sources, you'll see at the top that you'll have each aircraft designated both in terms of its weapons load its fuel load, and most importantly, its weight. You'll also see that the EM diagram will specify a particular altitude at which it is relevant. Now from this particular example, we can see that we have a load factor for the two aircraft, the two aircraft, of course, being the F-4 and the A-4 Skyhawk. The load limit is very similar no real clear advantage one versus the other in terms of load limit. If we look at maximum speed, we can see that the Phantom has a much higher 
rated Mach number at this particular altitude than does the Skyhawk, which again should not be a surprise to anyone. The Skyhawk was developed as a subsonic attack jet, and the Phantom was developed as a supersonic interceptor. So this should not be a surprise. At the left-hand side, we can see the lift limit for the two aircraft. And, not surprisingly, the A-4 Skyhawk has a lower stall speed and con consequently a better turn rate at these low speeds than does the Phantom. We can also see where the max instantaneous turn rate for each aircraft occurs. Again, the Phantom would prefer to turn at a higher Mach number or higher airspeed. And the turn rate for the A4 is obviously superior in terms of its instantaneous capability. We can also see the lines that plot out where each aircraft has zero specific excess power. And where they cross tells us something about how each aircraft would prefer to fight. So for the Skyhawk, the pilot would prefer to fight where his aircraft has the energy advantage. That is at the upper left-hand side of this flight envelope. That's where the Skyhawk can turn and either gain specific excess power or lose it more slowly than his counterpart. The Phantom pilot would be advised to fly in the lower right-hand corner of the envelope where he can out-accelerate his opponent. So there's a great deal of information that can be obtained by an EM diagram, not merely in terms of what an aircraft is capable of, but also in terms of tactically how it would be employed in practice However, there are a number of factors beyond energy maneuverability that can also play a crucial role in the success or failure of a particular design. An example is control authority. During the Korean War, on paper, the MiG-15 should have had a clear advantage over the F-86 Sabre in terms of its turn rate. It had a much lower wing loading than its American fighter of the day. However, the MiG employed traditional pull rods, pulleys for its control system, whereas the F-86 was the first aircraft to employ hydraulically boosted control systems. The result was that the MiG pilot had to exert much greater loads, much greater force on his control stick in order to maintain a turn at high G. Moreover, the MiG also suffered from a phenomenon known as aileron reversal. This happens when the wing twists under G-load, and at high Gs, the effect of the aileron actually reverses from what was intended. So instead of rolling in one direction, you roll in the other direction. And the result quite often was loss of control and loss of aircraft. Another example can be seen in the sizing of control surfaces. If you compare the YF-16, for example, to the production F-16, you'll see that they scaled up the horizontal tail to provide additional control authority. A similar phenomenon occurred between the YF-22 and the F-22. And obviously today, many aircraft employ fly by control systems and relax static stability to help gain a slight edge in terms of their dynamic or instantaneous response. Weapon systems also play a big role. Entering into the Falklands War in 1983, for example, the British had not yet invested the resources into the next generation of air-to-air -air missiles, all aspect air-to-air -air missiles. Fortunately for the British, they had a good friend. The United States, under then-President Ronald Reagan, provided the British with advanced air-to-air -air missiles with an all aspect capability directly from U.S. stockpiles. This meant that the British could engage their opponents from a head-on engagement, whereas the Argentines had to maneuver behind their opponent for their heat-seeking missiles to lock onto the hot exhaust. This gave the British pilots a clear edge. Another example is the combination of high off-bore sight missiles and helmet-mounted sights. 
These were first introduced by the Russians in practical service during the 1980s. What this technology allows is for the missile to maneuver immediately after leaving the rails to go out and seek out its opponent. And when in combination with a helmet-mounted sight to designate these opponents, it increases the kill envelope for that missile by an order of magnitude. The United States did not realize the decisive advantage this particular technology gave to opponent until the Berlin Wall fell, and the United States had an opportunity to experiment with the technology firsthand in engagements with the East German Luftwaffe. Against the MiG-29s of the East German Air Force, the U.S. very quickly discovered that U.S. F-15s and F-16s were at a distinct disadvantage. In fact, an overwhelming disadvantage. This led the United States during the 1990s to invest in the development of the AIM-9X to provide ourselves with another missile that could have a similar capability for U.S. inventory, as well as to implement a helmet-mounted sight based upon a proven successful design by Elbit in Israel. And finally, sensors. Sensors are a big part of being able to figure out where your opponent is and decisively to get that first shot. The introduction of AWACS revolutionized air combat as we know it today. At the end of the day, however, it needs to be emphasized that the pilot remains the decisive factor. Pilot training is crucial. The pilot is not a technician. The pilot does not just look down at a radar screen, see a target, designate, and fire, and then move on to the next target. It's not that simple, and it's never been that simple. The pilot has to be a tactician, has to know how to put his weapons on the enemy without exposing himself to undue risk from the enemy's weapons. Finally, there is the question that some I'm sure will raise regarding whether or not energy maneuverability and maneuverability in general is still relevant in a missile age. But if we actually look at the data from real combat scenarios, what we'll find is that the majority of air-to-air -air kills actually occur within visual range, even in a missile age. In 1986, the U.S. Air Force funded a study that found only four beyond visual range kills in all of the preceding decades prior to them. This study encompassed both U.S. and foreign air-to-air -air kills. Out of 407 successful missile kills, only four were actually fired from beyond visual range. In other words, just because a missile could have been launched from beyond visual range doesn't mean that it was launched from beyond visual range. Now this experience has been somewhat transformed by more modern sensors, but even in the 1991 Gulf War, 58% of all the kills that occurred were made from within visual range. That's 16 beyond visual range launches out of 38 successful Allied kills. Looking to the post-Gulf War era, three out of 11 air-to-air -air kills were made from beyond visual range. Or in other words, 73% of all missile kills are still made within visual range. This should not be a surprise to us. Jet aircraft don't move along at the same pace as a guided missile cruiser. So you may start an engagement from beyond visual range, but it's not uncommon that by the time you actually identify your opponent and fire the missile, you are within visual range, and that should not surprise anyone. Moreover, studies into the dynamics of air combat have shown that even in beyond visual range engagements, that maneuvering is still essential you still need to be able to put your weapons onto the enemy before he can put his weapons onto you. And maximizing your chances of doing that are characterized by very careful power management.